Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Microsoft Flight Simulator and in today's episode in preparation of the release of my next version of the A320 guide we're going to be talking about hopefully the accurate and pilot way if you will to start the aircraft. If you are interested in acquiring any of my Overkill's tutorial guides for Microsoft Flight Simulator please consider joining me on Patreon. Patreon subscribers level tier 2 and above have access to all of my guides as well as any future updates and future guides that will be coming down the road. Link to Patreon can be found in the description below. Okay, everybody, so quick disclaimer. Um, obviously, I am not a real-world A320 pilot. Uh, I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, so everything that I am going through here is based on research and all the documentation that I've been able to get, uh, dig up and then even some commentary from you all uh, down in the comments below on my YouTube videos. As I stated, I'm getting ready to release my next version of the A320 guide. It's got a pretty significant overhaul, specifically with the startup process and... Uh, in a way to better honor the correct flows um, that are used when starting up the aircraft. So we're going to go through um, some of those changes today. We're going to walk through the flows as far as how to get the aircraft ready for configuration right up until the MCDU configuration. Um, and then we'll be looking into over the next couple of days things like um, MCDU configuration, startup, taxi, and takeoff because there's actually quite a bit of differences uh, between what I've been using in the guides to what is done in real world. Um, so again I am trying to iron this thing out to get it as realistic as possible the other advantage to this is that I'm what I'm looking for is that way when the Phoenix a320 releases um, the guy that we use here for the fly-by-wire a320 will at least um, be feasible as a good starting location so without further delay let's go ahead and get started Okay, so getting right into it, as we step into the seat, we're going to make sure that engine switches 1 and 2, master switches, excuse me, are in the off position. We're going to verify that the engine uh, mode selector is set to norm. Then what we're going to do is step forward and verify that our landing gear handle is in the down position. Moving up to the overhead panel, we're going to verify that both wipers on the captain and first officer side are off. Moving to the batteries, we're going to make sure battery 1 and 2 are off and that batteries 1 and 2 voltage is reading above 25.5 volts, at which point we can now select batteries 1 and 2 to the auto position. Now they're not going to particularly illuminate, so, so focus. We're going to depress 1, you'll see that now charges the lights for number 2, depress 2, and now both of them are now in the auto position as desired. With both batteries 1 and 2 in the auto position, if the external power of veil light is illuminated, it means that we have external power available to the aircraft, in which case we will now depress that and select it to the on position. Now to give you guys an example of what I'm looking to do here with these next steps moving forward, some steps will still be skipped even though they are according to real world operational procedures. Um, and by the way, also some of these procedures can change based on company versus, you know, Air American Airlines versus Delta, etc. So um, we're just going by the generalized A320 procedures, what we're going by. But uh, to give you an example of things that I'm skipping is, for example, after 20 minutes, batteries 1 and 2 should be cycled off and tested, and the voltage should be tested. Um, for simulation purposes and, you know, speed of use, we're going to go ahead and skip steps of that nature. So moving forward here, we're going to go ahead and make sure that our APU uh, uh, fire extinguisher or fire system is pushed in and guarded. Depress the test light. Make sure that the discharge light does illuminate. And then we're going to also step down to the sorry upper ECAM and verify that we have the APU fire and uh, notification instructions below it. Stepping back upstairs. Make sure the APU fire switch is guarded, and we can now begin starting the APU. To start the APU, we're going to step on down to the master switch here. After three seconds, we can then depress the start switch. Once you started the APU, the APU page on the lower ECAM will automatically display. Flap open indicates that air intake is being done by the APU. Remember, the APU is nothing more than a small engine. 
monitor APU RPMs between 95 and 100 percent. I believe for fly-by-wire it will be at 100 percent. We'll see an available light pop up here as well as on the start switch. We'll sit and uh, monitor that for just a moment. Okay, at this point we can now see the avail light showing here on the lower ECAM page. 100% on the RPM. Stepping upstairs, you now have the avail light also on the APU start switch. So from this point, we're going to come back downstairs here, and we're going to start setting our cockpit lights as desired. So there's our PFD, primary flight display, nav display for the uh, pilot. Same for the first officer. Upper and lower ECAM displays. Flood and pedestal lights is as required. And the we have the FCU, backlighting as well as screen light. And then finally one more upstairs, we have the um, dome light. It is recommended at all times that the dome light be left on, as in the event of an electrical emergency, um, it will be the only thing illuminating the cockpit. Now the dome light, excuse me, correction, needs to be left on, uh, recommended on dim until after takeoff. Okay, so now that we have all of our lights set, we will come back down to the pedestal and verify that our parking brake is set. And then what we should be doing is coming over to the accumulator here. This is our accumulator. And you can see we have accumulation pressure and then brake PSI. Now, brake PSI uh, should be between 2,000 and 2,700 pounds. Now, what you guys are going to find out is I depress the brakes. This isn't currently modeled, which is funny because I thought I remembered that it was. Now, a uh, uh, little disclaimer, I am on the experimental version, so I don't know if that's something been removed, but honestly, I haven't checked it in the development in so long, so that's fair to say. But anyway, now in the event this is modeled and we need to recharge the accumulator pressure because as we depress the foot pedals, um, that pressure um, will start to bleed down. So in the event that we need to recharge it, we can step upstairs and come up here to the, notice we have green, blue, and yellow on the hydraulic and, uh, or on the hydraulic system, excuse me. And we come over here and hit the electric pump. It will show fault for just a moment and then clear. And then at that point, if we came back downstairs, we would see the accumulator pressure. Oh, the accumulator pressure is actually rising. So there you go. I guess just the brakes isn't actually draining it. So that was actually a good catch for me. I didn't see that last time. So that's a good thing. Um, accumulator pressure should be in the green. That is exactly what we're here to verify. So once that's done, come back upstairs and turn off the electric fuel pump. Okay, and from this point, now we're going to verify that the flap handle is in the full retracted position, and then we're going to verify that by coming up to the upper ECAM and verifying that it agrees with the flap handle, indicating that the flaps are up and indeed retracted. Okay, and then now that we're done there, we want to make sure that the speed brake switch is uh, retracted and disarmed. This is the armed position that is disarmed. From there, we're going to go back to the overhead panel and verify on the air conditioning panel here that all white lights are de-illuminated, so there are no white lights on. And then set your zone temperatures here as desired. On the electric panel, we want to make sure there aren't any faults or amber lights except for Gen 1 and Gen 2. This is because both engines are off. The engines are what spin the generators, so until the engines are running, you're going to see a fault on Gen 1 and Gen 2. And then finally over here on the ventilation panel, we want to make sure that all lights are, again, off. Okay, so this section can be a little hard to see, so bear with me, guys. I hope that you guys can see everything. Our next step here in our checklist, we would hit the recall button and depress it for three seconds. If there were any errors or alerts from the previous flight, they should display here on the upper ECAM. Now, I do not believe that this is currently modeled as as soon as you depress it, the button actually releases. Um, so just, again, keeping with what's currently available versus how what we should be expected to see later on. And I'm sure at the rate that the fly-by-wire team moves, we will definitely see that soon. Then we're going to move on over to the door page, and we're going to check that the... Uh, oxygen PSI is above 1500. If it is below 1500, you do want to check the FCOM manual and verify that the pressurization matches the necessities for your current flight. 
from the door page we're then going to move to the hydraulic page and you can see here what our hydraulic pressure level is now it is going to dis display as low obviously as again as the hydraulic system is currently disabled but this is making sure that everything is in the green and the, within normal parameters which it currently is displaying from the hydraulic page we're going to move over to the engine page and at this point we're going to be checking the fuel quantity you want to make sure that your fuel quantity is above 9.5 quarts plus uh, whatever's needed for the trip and how that's determined is it's a it's estimated at approximately half a quart per hour of operation so for example if we had 10 quarts on board um, we would be safe for about, a, for about one hour of flight um, so just keep that in mind as you are running through these however I do not believe that oil usage is currently modeled in the aircraft okay so that covers the preliminary cockpit preparation now we're gonna go into the cockpit preparation so how this would you would typically see this is Preliminary cockpit preparation would typically be done by the first officer, is my understanding, at which point once the preliminary is complete, the first officer or captain, whomever it would be, um, would then do the external um, inspection of the aircraft. So we're going to simulate our first officer's out, walking around, he's doing the external inspection of the aircraft while we complete the rest of the uh, cockpit preparation. Now, before we get into the steps of the flow, one thing I do recommend doing is you're going to come to the fly pad in the case of the fly-by-wire A320. This is specific to this aircraft. Um, and if you have your sim brief, you would load your sim brief uh, data because that's going to give us our operational flight plan information, which we want. We're going to come to the OFP, and I do recommend at this time that we fuel and load the aircraft. So 13,968 pounds. We're going to go to our oops fuel page. 13968 and we're going to hit play here all right and you can see it now the aircraft is fueled the reason why i do this because you want to simulate the aircraft is fueled because one of the things that we're going to do upstairs next is we'll be turning on the fuel pumps you don't really want to do that until it's on same thing with the nose uh with the um seat belt signs you never turn your seat belt signs on until the aircraft is fueled and that way in the event of emergency and someone you need to rapidly get out the airplane no one has to fumble with their seat belts to get out okay all right so those are the two steps that I do recommend. Again, that's specific to, as far as the fly pad goes, specific to the A320. But as far as fueling and loading the aircraft, you do want to do that uh, before continuing with the next steps is recommendation. All right. So at this point, what we're going to do is one of the things that sort of goes without saying, according to the um, standard operating procedures for the A320, it's actually A319 through A3, A321 is the document that I found. But we want to clear all white lights. So we're going to turn our fuel pumps on and crew oxygen supply. All right, now at this point, what we're gonna do is gonna turn our ground control on. We're gonna do the flows. So it's basically gonna go up from the left, up from the center, and then up from the right. Now we are also gonna be reaching to the full rear panel that's back over here. We'll be taking a look at that later, so keep that in mind. All right, so we wanna turn our ground control on. Now I'm gonna do my best to stay very quiet here. What we're gonna do is depress this and do the CVR test. Now, normally you would have loudspeaker volume, which is found here and in the same location on the first officer side. However, they're not currently modeled. So in this case, we're just doing the ground control to turn to on and then depress the CVR test and you should hear a very faint tone. Okay, and the tone did play. I hope it comes up on you guys' end, but it is there. Uh, again, it's very, very faint, it goes doo. Okay, once that's complete, the ground control switch can now be turned back off again. And then we're going to go to the evacuation order and set the captain um, switch. So basically this determines whether or not the captain or first officer in this position can uh, initiate a an evacuation uh, alert. In this case, we want to set this to captain as nobody gets off my plane without my permission. That's just, I'm a stingy guy like that. What do you want me to say? Okay, so now with that complete, our next step will be move upstairs to the ADIRs, and we're going to go one, two, and three, and activate the GPS system. Okay, now the alignment process, there's three different settings, and I'll show you guys those real quick. We'll come down to the fly-by-wire fly pad again, and go to realism, and you can say ADIRs align time. Instant is exactly what it sounds like. Fast is seven minutes, I believe, and real is ten. Um, so it's up to you guys, obviously, what you choose to do. The same thing with the DMC self-test and boarding time. All of these options are here and uh, completely configurable. It's really nice. So 
right down to the data link transmission time, this is the time that it takes for uh, your MCDU to populate with your company information from your for your flight plan. So stepping back upstairs, we've now completed the ADIRS alignment. Now moving back down to the bottom, so we've completed this side. Now we're going to come up here. And next we're going to take a look at the exterior lights. Now the one that is required, we want the strobe light into the auto position. Beacon light remains off. And wing and nav and logo lights, those are up to you. So we're going to do wing lights and nav and logo. Oops, there we go. Okay. And then seat belt signs again, now that the aircraft is completely fueled, we don't have to worry about that. So seat belt signs do come to on. And no smoking needs to go to the auto or on position and emergency exit lights to the arm position. Landing elevation remains um, where it's at, and we want to make sure that the cabin pressurization mode selector, which is this guy here, so this is manual, and in which case we would have to adjust the rotary here to our landing elevation, or in our case we want to leave it in the auto position, which is non-illuminated. Okay, so moving up to the passenger flow. If you have less than 115 passengers, you're going to want to set this to low. If you are in abnormally hot and humid conditions, so somewhere like, you know, maybe Miami, Florida in the middle of summer, you would probably kick this over to high. For all other conditions, we would leave it in the normal position. I do believe we do have more than 115 passengers today. We have 142 if memory serves, so we're going to leave that in the normal position. Okay, and then on the ECAM page, this is we're going to have to step downstairs for just a minute. So let's come down here. We're going to select the electrical page here, and we're going to be monitoring the voltage here. Now notice we have battery 1 and battery 2 at 28 volts, but 0 amps. Now what we want to do here is we're going to go upstairs, and we're going to turn batteries 1 and 2 off. Oops, there we go. All right, and you can see that they are indicating off here. Come back upstairs, turn them back on. And we should have seen a charge there. Um, we should see the amperage rising. Um, oh, there we go. There they go. Okay, now they're going to rise. They're going to show a charge again. But as time goes on, these are going to start to decrease once again. So, and that's normal. We should be seeing discharge. Okay, so now we are moving over to the fuel page. Or the fuel panel, excuse me. Now, the fuel panel, we get to leave alone except for in the event that our center tanks do not have any fuel in it. So again, what we can do is we can come down, come on, there it goes, back to our clipboard here, go to the fuel page, and you can see the center tank has nothing in it. It's completely empty. So, in which case, we are going to step upstairs, and we're going to turn the center fuel tanks off. Now, we should have to select the mode selector into manual, but that doesn't seem to be modeled. From the fuel panel, we're now going to move up to the engine fire test. So much like the APU test, we're going to make sure that the fire handle itself is guarded and pushed in. Press our depression switch, verify that the uh, uh, discharge lights illuminate. Moving down to the upper ECAM panel, again, verify that we have our warning as well as, well as checklist available. And then we can release. Stepping back upstairs and rinse and repeat for engine two. Now at this point here from the engine fire panel, you want to move your camera further aft and then you're going to be looking for this one here, the audio switching panel. You're going to verify that it's in the norm position. And then the final step in our right hand flow here is if you want, you can just back the camera out way out. You don't need to see anything just yet. We're looking for any lights here. Any lights would indicate a fault or problem. We don't have any. So moving back the camera back in and back towards the front. I just want to get this right for you guys. The only other thing that you need is on the third party audio panel, which is this one here. It And it's not currently modeled, but if it was, you would want to make sure this PA rotary is set to above half. And this allows the PA announcements to also be um, recorded in the CVR, the uh, cockpit uh, voice recorder. Okay, so now moving to the pedestal, we're going to come over here to the RMP or radio management panel. And what we're going to be looking for is on both sides, first officer and pilot side, we want to make sure that the nav button here, that the green light is not illuminated, that the select light is not illuminated, as well as tuning in our desired radio frequency. So check in again, pilot side and first officer side. Okay. And then at this point, you would get your air airfield data, you would get your clearance, 
and with clearance we would get our transponder code and set the transponder into the auto position and at this point we could also initialize the A cars and uh, start the um, uh, FMGC programming. So at this point we would be set to come down and begin our MCDU setup. Now we're going to save that for the next video as I know we've already chewed up quite a bit but I did want to show you guys what the proper flows were to starting up the A320. From the next video we're going to the uh, a manual entry for the uh, MCDU. I know almost all the time now I use the SimBrief link. So in the next video we're going to go through a manual entry once again of the uh, MCDU and then we'll be also taking a look at the proper procedures for pushback, taxi, and takeoff. So it should be a lot of fun, guys. I'm really, uh, I'm really blown away by the things that I'm learning now and realizing things that were wrong. Uh, to Patreon subscribers and anyone who you are interested in my uh, full flight tutorial guide, the tutorial guide goes from a cold and dark state, including all the information that we just discussed and much, much more um, from Tucson over to Los Angeles back to a cold and dark state again. And it has everything that you could possibly need. All flight plan information is in it. Um, all air racks are currently up to date um, and uh, flight paths are accurate currently. Um, and if that ever changes, I will be editing the document to match the uh, current air rack. So um, if you guys are interested in a guide like that, please consider joining me on Patreon. I really appreciate all the support. Also, Patreon subscribers tier two and above have access to all of my guides, not just the A320. So you have the A320, the uh, Cessna Citation Longitude, the TBM 930, which doubles up as a G3000 guide, a G1000 guide, and an advanced MCDU guide. Um, and I feel like I'm missing one. Um, but uh, anyway, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please keep in mind that, again, I am not a real-world A320 pilot, and uh, everything that I've put into this video here is based on documentation that I found in, in comments from people who I happen to interact with. So, I, again, hope you guys appreciate the information. Hope you've learned something. And as always, stay safe and healthy. I'll see you in the next one.